Good morning. Please grab your Voices Together books and turn to number 182, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and filled the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines low that God's commands and all the stars obey. I sing the Waters at Creation. Greetings to everyone. What a pleasure it is for us to gather in this place. I'm Luke Gasha, the worship leader uh, this morning. Welcome to this place, a sanctuary. We often think of sanctuary inside, but we're in a wonderful sanctuary outdoors where we worship the creator of the universe, the one who is also the sustainer and redeemer of all creation. We welcome people who are joining us virtually in various settings, close by and at a distance, and people who in another time will join for this worship service. May God grant us wisdom and courage as we, as a congregation of people, desire to welcome all people in full embrace. The context of our worship gatherings are always important to understand. And this morning, 
I am happy to uh, present to us an additional part of our context by using this portrait that's up here uh, hanging on a scene from Christmas plays in the past, right? Some of you may recognize that. Um, but this portrait uh, is an amazing portrait of the three Rob sisters uh, in their uh, dance regalia. Uh, so Selfie, Liddy, uh, Lily, and Mimica uh, are pictured here. They are members of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi uh, in the Dowagic, um Michigan area. Uh, this photograph was taken in uh, 2015 by Sharon Hoogstratton. Sharon uh, is a member of the Citizen Band of Potawatomi out of uh, Oklahoma, Kansas area, but she's lived and worked as her career uh, in uh, the Chicago area uh, in art media work and is an amazing photographer. And so she's taken many, many pictures of Potawatomi people uh, at various powwows in their dance regalia. And she has expressed uh, gratitude for uh, our engagement of, as Waterford in purchasing this. So the Seeker Sunday School class, of which I'm a member, uh, purchased this particular portrait. And the, uh, if you followed the endowment fund, the endowment fund uh, actually gave an additional grant to fund one of the picture portraits of Sharon's that is uh, in the gallery there at the Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Elkhart. Uh, there are eight uh, portraits there. And Sharon is, is grateful for the way in which we have been acknowledging uh, the people who lived here in the past and the people who are still present with us. It's an important reminder to us that the Potawatomi, Miami, and other people are, are with us. They have not gone away, even though there are many trage tragedies that have happened to them uh, in history. And we're looking forward to having a more permanent display uh, of this and several other features of our history somewhere in the building. We're working on, on that as, as a reminder of the repair work that we need to do with most of us being white European settlers in this land uh, and space. So how do we repair the harm that is done? You can read a bit more about some of this in our buzz for today that I wrote uh, to explain some things, and I'm happy to talk with you about this um, in more detail. But I think this is an important step and act that we are taking. I was going to say put on your hat, and a bunch of us already do have on our hats. Uh, let that be some kind of a time machine, and let's go back 193 years ago. You doing okay out there? 193 years ago, so that's 1828. And let's imagine this place, and I'm basing what I'm sharing on history work that I've done with surveys and other documents. So we would be sitting or standing in a majestic grove of oak trees. Now, wouldn't that be nice, right? For those of you out there in the bright sunshine, right? We'd be in this amazing grove, and we could look out, and we could see various other trees, the elm, uh, we, we would see ash, we would see walnut, we would see maple of various kinds uh, out along the edge, but the oaks were, were predominant in this particular location. So I imagine myself as a Potawatomi person, almost 70 years old, standing here, reflecting in 1828, knowing that I can just walk 200 yards up here to the north, and get on a trail that takes me out that my people have used for many, many centuries that goes down to the Elkhart River just to the west of us. And as one would walk along there, you would encounter the pawpaw and the sassafras and then the grand, grand sycamores close to the edge of the water. And their sycamores are down there today as well. Not the same ones, but their ancestors also. A lovely place to go to the river. The water is so clear and so pure because all the wetland filter systems have not been disrupted. And so they've been filtering this water for centuries uh, that flows into the Elkhart. Change has impacted our lives. When I was a child, there were multiple pandemics of smallpox and, and scarlet fever that came through and uh, often would wipe out up to 50% of the people living in our village when they would come through severe pandemics, and I am fortunate to have escaped that demise. It's been about 20 years since we've had a pandemic, 
and that, that's good. Uh, I guess we're developing some resistance, and our population is increasing a bit. But then, you know, in 1812, our, our village, about four miles over here, Ashbanabi, was burned by Colonel John Jackson and others from the U.S. Army, and then burned again. And so, you know, we're kind of homeless in our homeland. I can follow that same trail and go to the east about a quarter of a mile, and I enter this vast prairie, the Elkhart Prairie. And along the edge of that prairie, the woodland savanna area, uh, my grandchildren picked me this basket of strawberries, one of the life-giving symbols of the Potawatomi even today. And then as I look out across the prairie, I can see the many summer encampments of families who've planted their corn and squash and beans and are collecting herbs and fishing and hunting and preparing for the winter to come. This is my home. This is a place I love and I enjoy, but I know, I hear change is coming. I hear that this fall, the fall of 1828, a treaty is going to be signed and our land will be lost to us and we'll be forced to move again away from this place. What will happen to this land? What will happen to my people? So it's in that context of our history intersecting with the peoples who lived here for a long time that I light the peace lamp this morning as recognition of that. We know the tragedies that are around us today in the world and in our region, but also remembering those of the past. This is River Sunday. And I want you to join with me in the following response. Since you don't have something printed in front of you, I'm going to raise my hand when I say a couple words, and then I will want you to repeat those words, OK? We invite, uh, we invite the rivers to worship with us, the Elkhart and the St. Joseph, Joseph, that flow to Lake Michigan. We invite the county creeks to sing, the Turkey Creek and the Rock Run. We invite the fauna to praise God with us, the Great Blue Heron and the Wood Duck, Dragonflies and Snapping Turtles, Beaver and Crayfish. We invite the flora to praise God with us, swamp oak and hickory, swamp oak and hickory. sycamore and pawpaw, sycamore and pawpaw. Marsh, marigolds and jewelweed. marsh marigolds and jewelweed. We join with the waters in praising God, upstream wetlands and downstream rapids, upstream wetlands and downstream rapids water in abundance. We celebrate the song of the river. Sing, river, sing. Sing, river, sing. God, our creator, loves rivers and water. So in the second chapter of the Bible, we have an account of rivers. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn and follow along with me. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible from uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 10 through 14. A river flows from Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides into four headwaters. The name of the first river is the Pishon. It flows around the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. That land's gold is pure, and the land is also, uh, also has sweet-smelling resins and gemstones. The name of the second river, river is Gishon, Gihon. It flows around the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, flowing east of Assyria, and the name of the fourth river is the Euphrates. Let's pray. 
God, our creator, thank you for creating rivers and watersheds in abundance, places that nourish our beings even when we don't know of it. Grant to us understanding, peace, and his desire to work at repair and restoration that your regenerative desires may be fulfilled. In the name of Christ, amen. There are multiple ways of giving. I suppose we could have trees to plant today as an act of giving. Uh, we don't have those in hand. Uh, we could have wetland plants that we would plant in a restoration project. But you may give offerings of monetary value into our baskets, doing that online, uh, or dropping them off at the church. May God bless each of our gifts as we share those um, together. Let's pray again. Again, Lord, we thank you for your abundance. We are richly blessed. We're thankful for the way in which the land and the water nourishes us. We thank you for the resources that you've given to us, and we share them together as a congregation to continue the work that you've called us to as a church, both local and global. May your name be praised. Amen. Krista, Revy, and children, come forward. Revy couldn't be here this morning, but he will join us the next time. I brought some other good friends along. So come on up, kids. Anybody else? One, two, three, four, five, six. If bigger kids want to come up too, that's fine. You are welcome. Okay, good morning. How are you this morning? Good. It's a little warm today, isn't it? So I brought some things with me in, in my bucket, and I had to have them in the shade because they get a little too warm inside of a container too because they're not normally found in a container. Can anyone guess? What I brought with me? Donuts. Donuts. <laughs> oh, I wish. I did not bring donuts, but that would be awesome. You said some kind of animal? Uh, oh, maybe a fish? Yeah. That's a really good guess because we are talking about rivers. Did you know that our church is really close to the river? Have any of you hiked down to the river before? Yeah. Have you hiked down to the wetlands? Yeah. yeah. Here at our church, we actually consider the wetlands, which is right down there, a sanctuary. It's part of our sanctuary. It's part of our church. And if you haven't gone down there recently, you should head down because there's all sorts of cool things. But we're going to talk about how amazing God is. And when we think about the river and the wetland, because I brought some things that live in the water to show you just how amazing. Ooh, a turtle's a good guess, too. This is smaller. Think smaller. Tadpole. Can you do this with your hand? Tadpole. This big. Ooh, tadpole. That's a good guess, too. We have all of those things in the wetland. They live in the river, and they get what they need there. Now, do you know, have you heard the word habitat before? So habitat is where we get what we need. So what are some things that people need in their habitat? What would you say? Food. Food. We need food, like donuts, right? Shelter. What else? Yeah, we need sh a shelter or a home, a place to hide. What else? Water. water. How many of you had water today? Anybody drink water today? I just drank some before I came up here. Yeah, we need things too. And we need space, space to move around. And everything that's out in nature, including in the river, needs those things too. But one thing that I think we forget about is that we kind of need each other. We need connection. We need, we need friends. We need, we need people that we have a connection with, things that we have common with other people. And guess what? We have a connection with the things that I brought. 
with me today. You guys ready to see what I brought? Okay, there's water in there because they rely on water for sure, but they need space, they need food, they need water, they need shelter, just the same as you and I. So I think we'll do three tubs. Now my tubs are empty, well, for the most part. <laughs> they have residue from the last time, that's okay. So we are going to dump a few things in here so that you can see. Oh, you saw something in there, didn't you? They like to stay in the bottom too. Come on, come on. Oh, there's bugs. Okay, let's scoot that one closer to you guys. You guys can all come around this one. Take a look. You guys wanna see this one? And there's one for you to see. Now, what do you see in there? You see some bugs in there? Oh, yours is, has a leaf, too. Now, do you think those little bugs that are in there, would they like to hide underneath there? Yeah, these are, these are insects, most of them, and they are found in the water. They get everything they need there. You see it? It's a baggy book. Now, I'm going to hold one in my hand and let you look at it closer. This, believe it or not, is a baby insect. Can you guys find one that looks like that in yours? Mommy. You have a whole bunch in yours. Let me grab another one from yours. Yeah, this is actually a baby dragonfly. Oh. We, I found so many of them down here in the, in the wetland. They're living underwater. They're living in there. Now, how do you think we're connected to those? Do we have connection to them? Ooh, you found one with two legs. Fun. What do you think? Do you see two bugs in there? Yeah. There's a lot more than just two. And I only scooped with my net a couple times and was able to get all of these insects in there. Now, when you look at the water, do you see them? They're all hiding underneath, aren't they, in the river itself? But do you think we're connected to these? Are we connected to a baby dragonfly in some way? Okay, so when they grow up, we see them where? We see them flying. Flying, that's right. But how do they survive in the water and then mm. later? That is a really cool question, and it's a good question. They die off while you're flying. They change, even on the inside. So they swim and they breathe like a fish when they're babies. And when they become an adult, they change, they go through, it's a big word, metamorphosis, and they change into the adult that breathes air just like you and I. <sighs> just like that. It's amazing, kind of like a frog. They change too, from a baby to an adult. But now, we're connected with these because we need similar things. We need water, we need space, we need food. Do we eat the same food as a baby dragonfly? No. no. But. <laughs> it probably would be yucky for us, you're right. But they are growing and living and they are part of our ecosystem, our sanctuary that's out here. And we invited them, we invited the, <laughs> might get a little wet up here, sorry about that. Oh, I love water too. I got muddy already this morning. But they're a part of our ecosystem they are um, an important part. If we didn't have little insects like this, there would be no food for the fish. And if there was no food for the fish, how many of you guys like to eat fish? Anybody? No. no? Like you like what? I like to eat fish. I like to eat fish. I, okay. I love fish, so I can grow big and Ooh, fish does help you grow big and strong. That's right. Yeah, and meat, too. <laughs> and meat, too. That, that's right. And, and occasionally a donut. That's true. That can help give you energy at least. So these guys are a part of that system, a part of God's amazing creation. And they, they are connected with us through the water. You guys said some of you drank water. Did anybody take a shower or a bath recently? Mm. You took one yesterday, good. Whew. Did anybody brush your teeth this morning? 
not yet? Boy, we're finding out all sorts of things, aren't we? <laughs> That's okay. How about, did anybody flush the toilet this morning? Oh, see, we use water for all sorts of things. Now, it may not be the river water that you're using, but all the water is connected through the rivers, through the streams, some of which we named this morning. And these guys live there. These guys are helping us to have clean air through the plants and things that grow with them. Yeah. I do have a sprinkle on my head and my head. Did you know? Okay. That, that, that one that kind of looks like a spider. It's like, it's like a, it's, it's like a, it's like a, uh, uh, looks kind of like a spider, he says. It is like an underwater spider. You're right. Yeah, underwater. This one that looks like now, there are some beetles in there, too. There's even a snail right here. You can see there's a snail. I'll bring it around to show you. There's a snail. You see it? All of these guys are part of that outdoor sanctuary that we have. That's a snail. Uh, I think that's just a rock. Okay. Now, next time you guys go down by the water, or even in your backyard. I want you to think about how we're all connected. Now these connect us through our water, through our, how we breathe. Did we br actually breathe in a lot of water too, in the air. You'll learn about that when you get older. Did, but we're all you know, connected. Did, yeah. Did, it's warm enough that we got out our new pool. Oh, yeah. so you even have fun in the water, right? In your pool? Yeah. See, we're all connected. We all need water. Ooh, that it goes with. It's connected. It is connected. You're right. Yes. It's all connected. Great. And well, then if you hook a hose up to it and start running the water, you kind of have to adjust it because sometimes when you start it, it goes out of the pool, but it's supposed to go in the pool. But sometimes I like it out of the pool. I see. It can sprinkler all the way out of the pool. <laughs> water is a great subject. We can just go on and on, right? All right, well, next time you guys go down to the, for a hike, I want you to look around and see what you can find outside of the water and maybe even peek along the edge and see if you can see any of these guys in the water too. But God is amazing. He provides all sorts of connections to the, na to the natural world and through our rivers. It's just absolutely amazing. Okay, I'm going to get these guys back to the wetland because they don't like it being in here very long, especially on such a hot day. So go ahead and head back to your seats. And thank you for coming up here. Thank you, Krista and friends. So before I read the scripture this morning, I'd like to introduce our guest preacher this morning. Our preacher has come to us from upstream. You know what that means, right? Up the stream, right? So uh, he was thinking about getting in his canoe at, at Benton Mennonite Church and then coming this way, but it'd take a little longer. And so, and especially since he's on sabbatical, can you believe it? He's here on sabbatical preaching for us today. Uh, that's one of the downsides, as he and I have talked, of having two halftime jobs. Uh, so you take sabbatical from one and you still do the other one, right? Um, but it, it is a blessing, Doug, to have you here this morning. I've been so grateful to have you as a friend. Uh, for, I don't know, 15 years or, or so, as we've related on a lot of topics that somehow often intersect with river conversations. And I uh, remember back in 2016, we met for coffee, um, and you shared a vision you had, like a one-page sheet about how you could train people in ministry of watershed management and care, going up and down the Elkhart and St. Joseph River. And it was a great conversation, and we left, well, let's see what happens. I mean, who has money for this, and how would this happen? Well, we didn't know, but just a little over a year later, I uh, called up Doug and said, hey, let's meet for coffee. And at that point, I was a board member of the Center for Sustainable uh, Climate Solutions, uh, a group working out of uh, Eastern Mennonite University, Goshen College, and Mennonite Central Committee North America, <clears throat> and said, you know, uh, we believe 
that having somebody lead work in the church across North America, uh, especially in the United States, in learning ecological connections and particular paying attention to how do we work on climate change issues as a church. Uh, Doug was in the process at that point of earning uh, his second master's degree, his first master's degree from um, Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, but from the Toronto School of Theology, uh, a master's degree in theology and ecology, a wonderful combination, which I hope more and more trained pastors will take in the future because of the importance of that connection. And so, Doug, it's, it's great to have you come and, and share from your wisdom, your learning, uh, your passion, and the work that you do. And by the way, he's upstream of us, so he does work at making sure the water's a little cleaner when it gets down to us. Uh, he may talk about that. So two scripture passages, first from uh, the Gospel of John, as Jesus in chapter 7, verse 37, says this, On the last and more, most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and shouted. All right, no microphone system. Um, All who are thirsty should come to me. All belie who believe in me should drink. As the scriptures said concerning me, Rivers of living water will flow out within him. Jesus said this concerning the Spirit. Those who believed in him would soon receive the Spirit, but they hadn't experienced the Spirit yet since Jesus had not yet been glorified. From creation, Pharaoh frees the slaves, but in a final act of watery redemption, the Hebrews pass through the Red Sea, but the Egyptian army is swallowed by it. And this act of redemption is repeated in a small way when they go through the Jordan River. That Jordan River becomes a new place of redemption a thousand years later when John the Baptist chooses this place for his ministry of repentance and forgiveness of sin. And Jesus joins in this act of redemption by himself being baptized in the Jordan River. And finally, in the final chapter of the Bible, we once again, again come back to the river of life found flowing from the throne of God. And whatever pollution has occurred, it is, it is now again clean and purified. The water is holy. And Revelation reminds us that Heaven is not just some location in the clouds for human souls, but the reign of God brings a renewal to all of creation. Other creatures are there, trees and rivers. So our calling, I believe, in relation to God's creation is to be people bringing about this renewal, working towards the renewal of her rivers, partners with God in restoring creation. The need is great. Water is essential to life. We live in a watershed that is abundant with water, and so for us, the bigger problem is cleanliness of that water. It was in Cleveland, after all, in our watershed, just off of Lake Erie, when the Cuyahoga River burst into flames in 1969, leading to the Clean Water Act. In other places, such as the American Southwest, the problem is a lack of water. The Santa Fe River is often a dry riverbed because the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico, dams the river to provide water for the city. Do we have the right to take the water from a river? Does a river or the creatures who make their home in the river have a right to have their home? What about those who live along the banks of the river? As we weigh the needs of agriculture, industry, and populations, these are not necessarily uh, easy questions to answer, although I think there is some right. <laughs> because the need is great, it's easy not to do anything. At Benton, we've done a few things, and, and it's hard to really do enough. But I was trained with Hoosier River Watch. Um, I'm trying to remember if Krista was the one who trained me. I think she, yeah, yeah, she was. So, <laughs> uh, you know, not not to age her, but, you know, 17 years ago or something like that. <laughs> Um, at Bonneville, and uh, we, we did not, during COVID, uh, test the water, but we've been testing the water we, for 15 years. Um, we look for levels of E. coli bacteria, which helps us to know about how much manure is in there, nitrates, phosphates, 
the amount of dirt in the water, many other things. And then you also saw biological testing, which is something we do. That's really just a way of, of seeing um, how the ecosystem is doing. What Are we finding the creatures we would like to see in the river? Are they, are they able to make a home there? And to me, it's the most powerful testing that we do. And we look for crayfish, mayfly nymphs, snails, and scuds. My favorite, and it's hard to find uh, here, uh, is the caddisfly larva. Because these small uh, larvae build a little house around them. They take the twigs or stones from the river bottom. And so fr from my perspective, it's easier, I guess, to think of them as a neighbor because they have a house like I have a house. And I think of evangelizing these neighbors, sharing good news with them. As our actions of baptism sanctify this river and make holy these little witnesses to these holy events, we keep baptizing in the river. And so I keep experiencing God's presence in the river, actually whether I'm baptizing or canoeing or testing. So I see our testing of the water as a way to listen to the ecosystem in our community. It's led to other activities, to focusing on creation and worship and Sunday school, adding solar panels to our building, river cleanups. It's amazing what people will put in a river. So in Genesis, the whole world is one watershed. And in this world today where climate change on a global scale is reminding us of our interconnections, maybe it's the time that we remember that not just spiritually but geographically, we too are in some sense in one watershed. How some of us treat our part of the planet affects all other parts. Uh, Luke mentioned that I work with the Center for Sustainable Climate Solutions now, and actually one of your young people is part of our climate ride that is, uh, has already started going across the country on bicycles. And they'll be passing through here. I'll be joining them uh, at the end of July as we make our way to Washington, D.C. So I'm excited about that. And it's uh, a joy to work with pastors and leaders on climate change and on uh, ecology. So God has given us this holy water, water that we are to treat as holy, water that is the water of life. We are connected through our watershed. We are connected as children of God along with the caddisfly larva and snails. So let us remember to keep God's water holy. So think about your own place, your own water. Learn to care about what happens here. Learn to care and love what God cares for and loves. Amen. Please open your Voices Together books to number 668, Oh Have You Not Heard.
verse 3 in English. This beautiful stream is the river of life. It flows for all nations free. A home for each wound in its water is found. Oh, sinner, it flows for thee. Oh, seek that beautiful stream. Do not be afraid to use your God-given gifts. Do not be afraid to say yes when the invitation comes to serve among us at Waterford. Do not be afraid to call out and empower others in our congregation when you see to name their own gifts. Do not be afraid. And yes, I'm saying do not. I'm also wearing a glove because this is a gluten-filled donut, and I have celiac. <laughs> Gifts Discernment Ministry team would like to celebrate and to offer to each of you our thanksgiving for the ways you have used your gifts among us over the past year in big ways and small ways that enabled us to continue to be the church to and with each other. And so you have guessed, we will celebrate today with donuts. So following the service, I invite you back to the corner uh, in the, where there's the shade. And there we will have donuts for you to say thank you for the ways you have been using your gifts. At this time, I'm going to invite the members of Gifts Discernment Ministry team to please stand. All of you. I knew they would love this part. We are led by Ken Otto, who is our lay ministry partner for gifts. I am the pastoral team member who sits with this group. And we're joined by Dan Boddicker, Bonnie Miller, Katie Kaufman, and Beth Smucker. Thank you. You can be seated. And so one of our tasks is that we discern together. And then we invite an, into key leadership positions in our congregation as well as encouraging the entire congregation to use your gifts wherever God would have you be. And so today we want to celebrate and to continue to hopefully inspire all of us to keep using our gifts. A timely specific need is the amount of people it takes to make our Sunday mornings happen. There's much that needs to happen often behind the scenes before and after our worship service. So please consider if this need might match your gifts. Now, one of the true joys of Gifts Discernment Ministry Team is the opportunity to celebrate and to acknowledge the ways that people live out and into their calling, their gifting, and their ministry. And so I would like to invite Pastor Katie to share with us a specific opportunity we have this morning to celebrate.
Good morning. Today, I have the privilege and representation of Family Life Ministry Team and the Children's Cluster to offer thanks and a blessing to Shar Stoltzfus, who is concluding her time teaching Sunday school in the Nurture Wing after 58 years of Sunday school teaching. Yes. Shar tells me she has taught Children's Sunday School 14 years after college in her home church at Martin's Mennonite in Orville and around 44 years here at Waterford. She mainly taught preschool and primary grades. She's also served twice as minister to children. First time she was asked to be on the pastoral team, she was in charge of adult nurture, children's nurture, junior youth nurture, and missions with a yearly meal and speaker. Later, she was the minister of children in the 90s to 2005. Uh, Shar especially noted appreciating regular meetings with Neil and also Mary Royer's preschool materials from Menno Media in the We Wonder series for twos and threes, which many of our kids have gone through. So I would like to invite you to stand if you or your child have been taught by Shar. If you are able to stand, if not, stand in your heart or with your hand. And let's just give a thank you to Shar. Thank you, Shar. You may be seated. We have a simple gift for Shar today, and um, it's just a couple of figurines, and one of them is called Wisdom um, and has a woman with a book open, um, seated and teaching. And the other is called Spirited Child. That seems right. And I invite you to read this week's Buzz, um, which has an article um, just with some pictures and recognizing Char. So in every milestone is a mixture of emotions, of endings and beginnings, of gratitude, maybe some sadness, possibly hope and relief. And it's our practice at Waterford to pause and celebrate milestones. Shar has been present and maybe even started some of these milestone celebrations that we recognize here at Waterford. Things like blessings of Bibles, beginning of school years, graduations, moving into your first home as an adult, marriages, retirements, births, so on and so on. And it's in these milestones, these traditions, that we recognize God is especially present and, that, and is teaching us new lessons. So by locating milestones in the worship service, we invite one another to trust God at the threshold. And so the celebration of Sar Shar's ministry in Sunday school teaching um, and minister to children is one that beckons us to stop and recognize God's presence that has been here with us and God's presence will always be with us. And that's true for you, Shar. I'll conclude with the final paragraph from this week's buzz. Shar, you have left an incredible legacy, and your church family is so grateful for how you have served God among us. You have communicated God's love by showing each child how much she or he matters. By being cared for by Shar, we, the children and grown-ups of Waterford, have been introduced to the loving arms of Jesus. Thank you for your commitment, your time, your energy, and your love. Congregation, be sure to thank Shar when you see her today. And I wonder who might God call to follow in a legacy like that? How might we use our gifts? at Waterford, in the church, and in the community. Thank you, Shar. Amen. On behalf of Gifts Discernment Ministry team, I want to say to all of you, thank you. Thank you for using your gifts. Thank you for offering holy yeses and holy noes. Please be sure to stop by and enjoy a donut. Do not be afraid. They are delicious donuts from Rise and Roll, as well as delicious donuts that are gluten and dairy free. So thank you. As we transition now to our time of prayer, I'd invite you to pull out your bulletin. 
And you will see on the back side of the order of worship is a list of our prayers and our praises. And to that list, I would ask that you add Inez Culp. Inez fell earlier this week and broke her hip and is currently in the hospital. And so I invite you to be in prayer for her. Today, I will be in concluding our time of prayer by reading something written by Macrina Whitaker where she will invite us to become more deeply connected to God's creation by listening to the sounds of summer. So please join me now in prayer. Gracious God, as we look at this list, we see that there is much to celebrate today, that there is much for which to offer our thanksgiving to you. We give thanks to you for the significant wedding anniversaries for Marvin and Rachel, Jim and Mary. We lift up with joy the upcoming weddings for Nate and Janet, Ryan and Carolyn. May you pour out your blessings on these four couples as they celebrate many years of married life or begin this beautiful marriage journey. God, you are good. And we rejoice with Dafka in receiving her COVID vaccine. And we join in offering a retirement blessing for Shar. Thanks to you, our almighty God. This morning, we are invited to pray for children near and far that they might continue to be formed in the legacy of faith in Jesus. We lift up children in Goshen, children in the ghettos, children serving with their parents in Africa, children in migrant and refugee camps. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As our great physician, we ask for healing for Inez of her body, mind, and soul as she yearns for her heavenly homecoming. May you gently gather her in your arms and speak tender words of love. It is with deep gratitude that we offer thanksgiving to you for Indiana Michigan Mennonite Conference and particularly for Dan's leadership over the past years. May your spirit continue to guide us forward as we seek to faithfully follow you. And creator God, we pour out our immeasurable gratitude for your creation. Help us to tend to it, to care for it, to protect it, to celebrate in it, to listen to it. God, this morning we are listening to the creation of the season of summer. Out of her pastel green pitcher, spring is pouring forth summer, and we are listening. Out of her youthful, energetic body, summer is flowing, and we are listening. We are listening to earth leaning closer to the sun, we are listening to the heat breathing through the gardens, drawing life out of the seeds, calling plants to fruition, whispering fulfillment to the flowers. We are listening to the growing circle of life. We are listening to the ripening in the orchards, in the vineyards, in the gardens, in the grain fields. We are listening to the ripening in our own hearts. We are listening to the summer of our souls, to the dance of life within us, to the fruitful struggle of all that yearns for life. We are listening to the warmth of summer. We are listening to the song of the gardener, bringing food to the table. We are listening to the meadow's promise of winter hay for hungry cattle. We are listening to Mother Earth growing wild with multiple vitamins. We are listening to summer songs of leisure and renewal, listening to the sound of happy voices playing on the beaches, shouting at the ball games, sharing stories on the front porches. We are listening to bare feet, laughter, fishing poles, summer picnics, and mosquitoes. We are listening to the spaces in between the green, listening to the young birds testing out their wings, listening to morning filling up with sunlight listening to the music of the evening twilight. We are listening to the night chant of a thousand tiny creatures. We are listening to fruitfulness, spilling forth from Earth's rich womb, 
We are listening to happy potatoes growing round beneath the ground. We are listening to the green cathedral of the forest, to the stars that peep through the summer branches. We are listening. We are listening to spring handing over summer. We are listening to the poetry of summer. We are listening. And God, we are thankful. In the name of Jesus, amen. I invite Doug to come to give a benediction. May the water of life flowing from the paradise of God flow in and through you, bringing peace, justice, and vitality with all God's creation and all God's creatures. Amen. Number 667. Thank you. 